Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with the Mighty Jingles. And today we're going to be taking a look at a ship that I'm sure a lot of you are very, very much looking forward to. The Congo-class battleship, the first really modern-looking warship. And when I say modern-looking, I mean World War II modern. But the first modern-looking warship in the Imperial Japanese Navy's battleship line. The Congo class are a wildly popular class of ship in World of Warships, and I suspect some of that is down to the success of the Japanese online game and anime show, Kantai Collection. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's a bunch of young girls who have embodied the spirits of World War II Japanese warships, and I told you it made no sense. <laughs> but some of the most popular characters on the show are the Mad as a Box of Frogs, Congo Sisters, and they are the four Congo-class battleships, Congo, Hai, Haruna, and Kirishima. And I have to admit, I have a bit of a soft spot for Kirishima myself, so much so that I actually went out and bought the statue. But anyway, we're talking about World of Warships here. So, what is it about the Congo, you know, well, other than that, that makes it such a popular ship? Well, she is a damn good ship, but the ship that you're looking at here in World of Warships is not the version of the Congo that was launched on the 18th of May 1912 from Vickers Shipbuilding in the United Kingdom. The Japanese decided they wanted some fast battle cruisers, and so they ordered their own modification of the British Lion-class battle cruiser. The first ship was built in Britain, the three sister ships were all built in Japan. This is actually what the Congo looked like when she was launched. Which is a pre-World War I design. Congo and her three sister ships were battle cruisers, not battle ships. What's the difference between a battle cruiser and a battleship jingles? Well, the whole concept of battle cruisers was an idea that was championed by Admiral Jackie Fisher, the first sea lord of the Royal Navy during World War I. The idea was that you take a fast, lightly armoured cruiser and you give it really, really big battleship guns. In the case of the Congo here, as specified during her construction, she was fitted with 14-inch guns. Those are 365mm guns, and she has eight of them. Meanwhile, back in the Royal Navy, Admiral Fisher was running into opposition from old diehards who didn't want their battleships cancelled so that he could build more battlecruisers. His fondness of the whole battlecruiser concept was somewhat vindicated, however, in 1914 during the First Battle of the Falkland Islands. The British had just suffered an embarrassing defeat at the Battle of Coronel on the 1st November 1914, at the hands of Admiral Graf Maximilian von Spee's cruiser squadron, consisting of the two armoured cruisers, Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, the light cruisers Nuremberg, Dresden and Leipzig, and three auxiliaries. Realising that he had to do something fast in order to restore British prestige, and also jumping at the opportunity to show his opponents within the Admiralty what battle cruisers were actually capable of, Admiral Fisher ordered a cruiser squadron led by the two battle cruisers Invincible and Inflexible, accompanied by the armoured cruisers Carnarvon, Cornwall and Kent, the armed merchant cruiser Macedonia, and the light cruisers Bristol and Glasgow, to avenge the loss at Coronel. In a massive stroke of bad luck, Admiral von Spee arrived at Port Stanley with his armoured cruiser squadron in an effort to conduct a raid on the British supply base there. Unfortunately, he arrived the day after the British fast battle cruiser squadron had arrived in order to take on fuel. In the battle that followed, the Germans lost six of their eight ships. The only survivors were the auxiliary Seidlitz and the light cruiser Dresden. British losses, 10 killed, 19 wounded, no ships lost. So, it did seem that the whole battlecruiser concept had been vindicated, but the raw casualty figures alone don't tell the whole story. Yes, the Germans did lose six of their eight ships, and it was a decisive victory for the Royal Navy. But the German armoured cruisers took a ferocious beating before they were eventually sunk, and the British battlecruisers, while they didn't suffer much in the way of casualties, they did take a lot of damage from return German fire. They just didn't have the armour to take the kind of beating that the German armoured cruisers could. Something that would have dire consequences two years later at the Battle of Jutland when Admiral Sir John Jellicoe made the disastrous decision of putting his battlecruisers in the main line of battle with his battleships in a gunnery duel with the German battleships. Three battlecruisers were sunk with massive loss of life. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, hang on, I don't like the sound of this, I want my battleships to have lots of armour. Why are these ships in the battleship line and not the cruiser line? Well, there are actually two reasons for that. And the first one's a game design reason. 
The difference between a battleship and a cruiser in World of Warships is down to the calibre of the main armament. If you have 203mm guns or lower, you're a cruiser. Anything bigger than that, 14-inch guns, 16-inch guns, or if you're driving the Yamato, 18-inch guns, you're very definitely a battleship, which puts the Congo very firmly with its 14-inch gun armament in the battleship tree. The second reason is because in the late 1930s, the Congos were all refitted and given substantial up-armouring, which very, very definitely turned them into proper battleships, and that's what you're looking at here in World of Warships. By the time the Imperial Japanese Navy had finished strapping armour onto their Congo-class battle cruisers and turning them into battleships, the decks had been strengthened with 58 to 38 millimetres of armour, with an extra 101 millimetres of armour on top of the ammunition storages, and an extra 76 millimetres on the engine rooms. The gun turrets all had 230 millimetres of armour, the barbettes along the flanks housing the secondary gun batteries had 250 millimetres of armour, and the ship's sides were protected by armoured belts, which ranged anything between 200 to 280 millimetres of armour. This was very definitely a battleship now. But it wasn't just a simple case of adding more armour to the ship. In order to effectively be able to support and escort Japan's rapidly growing fleet of aircraft carriers, the ship's old steam boilers were stripped out and replaced with oil-fired boilers, the ship was given improved gearing. The bridge was completely reconstructed. A pagoda-style mast was added to the ship, incorporating more modern fire control systems to better direct the fire of the 14-inch guns. The guns themselves were modified to give them increased elevation and therefore increased range. The ship was lengthened to support a catapult which could launch one of three float planes for reconnaissance, and the ship was given a very, very healthy anti-aircraft battery. By the time the Imperial Japanese Navy had finished refitting and modifying the four Congo-class battlecruisers in the late 1930s, they effectively had four brand new battleships, very well armed, very well armoured, and yet still capable of speeds in excess of 30 knots. And that is why these are very popular ships in World of Warships. Or at least, they are once you've spent some experience on upgrading them, because while a stock Congo is not a bad ship, it's a very, very slow ship. It doesn't matter how much experience you throw at this ship, those 14-inch guns are not going to get any bigger. Regardless of which gun upgrades are fitted, it's still going to have 14-inch guns. The stock hull configuration, while it doesn't have as good an anti-aircraft armament as the upgraded hull configuration, it's still one of the best, if not the best, anti-aircraft armament of any Tier 5 ship in the game. The stock fire control system still has a respectable 193 kilometer firing range, but the stock propulsion system limits the top speed of the ship to a pretty miserable 25 knots. My recommendation, as soon as you earn some experience on the Congo, is to get the propulsion system upgraded first. With that upgrade under your belt, this ship can really stretch its legs and get up to 31 knots in speed. Once you've done that, if you have any experience spare and you can immediately afford to get the fire control system, I recommend that's what you do, because it doesn't cost an awful lot of experience, and it does boost the range of the guns to 21.2 kilometers. If you can't immediately get the fire control system at the same time as the propulsion, I recommend you hold on to that experience and wait until you have enough to upgrade the hull, because when you upgrade the hull of the Congo, you improve what is already an impressive anti-aircraft armament for a Tier 5 ship into what is undoubtedly the best anti-aircraft armament for a Tier 5 ship. Now, don't get too excited, you're still not going to shoot down an entire torpedo bomber squadron making an attack run on your ship, but you're going to shoot some of them down, and that means less torpedoes in the water that you have to dodge, and your ship can now do 31 knots, so it's much easier to dodge them. All of which finally leaves us with the upgrades to our main battery 14-inch guns. We've got eight of them. Unfortunately, while the final gun upgrade is very, very good, the intermediate gun upgrade isn't. And this is why I say you get more value for money if you expend your experience on the propulsion system, the fire control, and the hull upgrades first. Obviously, you have to spend experience on the hull upgrade because that's what leads to the uh, weapon upgrades. But the intermediate weapon upgrade is not really very good value for money. All you get from the first gun upgrade is the rate of fire increases from 1.8 to 1.9 rounds per minute. Yep, big deal. There's absolutely no difference in the high explosive or armor piercing shell damage, and the rate that it takes the guns to rotate 180 degrees drops from 60 seconds, which is bad, 
to 51.4 seconds, which is still bad. With the final main 14-inch battery gun upgrade, which really should be the last thing you spend your experience on with the Congo, you get another incremental increase to your rate of fire, which boosts the rate of fire up to now two rounds per minute. You get a small bonus in the amount of extra damage your armor-piercing shells do, but you get a massive reduction in the speed that it takes to rotate those turrets, down to 37.5 seconds. And that, boys and girls, is the Imperial Japanese Navy Tier 5 battleship, the Congo. It is better in almost every way. Well, it's better in every way that matters than its predecessor at Tier 4, the Miyogi. Just about the only thing that the Miyogi beats the Congo on is its visibility range. You can see the Congo coming at a range of just over 16 kilometers. But even the Congo's stock guns can fire back at you at a range of 19.2 kilometers. 21.2 with the fire control system upgrade, so that really isn't a problem. I really do love this ship. It's well armed, it's well armoured, and you're not going to see the kind of speed that the Congo can do in Japanese battleship lines way past tier 6 and 7 with the Fuso and the Nagato. You're really going to miss the Congo's speed. So let's have a look at what the old girl can do. I've got two games to show you in the Congo. Um, what you're going to see, however, are edited highlights of those two games, because if I didn't edit them down, this video would be about 55 minutes long. Games last a hell of a lot longer in World of Warships than they do in World of Tanks, or they have the potential to do so, and these two games definitely did. The first match, Tier 5 Maximum, so very, very generous matchmaking. The second one, not quite so much. So, as always, first thing you do in any ship, not just a battleship, is you have a look at the team list. You have a look at what the threats are going to be to you, and you start planning well in advance how you're going to deal with them. Now, we have more ships than the enemy team, but we have more ships than the enemy team because our ships aren't as good as the enemy team's. We've got three Tier 5s. They have four Tier 5s, including one Independence-class carrier, as well as a Tier 4 Langley-class carrier. They have three battleships, so do we. All three of our battleships, however, are Tier 5s. Two of theirs are, and they also have a Tier 4. They also have a Tier 5 destroyer. Now, he's going to be nasty. The firing range of the Congo's guns, fully upgraded, 21.2 kilometers. Sounds impressive. And while it theoretically can hit the targets at that kind of range, the guns are hopelessly inaccurate. In fact, that really does seem to be the case on most battleships. Until you get down to ranges of around about 13 kilometers or less, Look at these cruisers, by the way. Do you get the impression that these are World of Tanks players? <laughs> Just driving everywhere out of the cap circle. Don't care who they run into. I'm a 36,000 ton battleship. Who do you think is going to come off worse? Apart from anything else, my turning circle is measured in football fields. <laughs> it is more difficult for me to get out of your way. So... Actually, Jingles, according to the internationally recognised maritime rules of the road... Oh, shut up. Small ships. Stay out of the way of big ships. Because you're small ships and it's easier for you. Anyway, where were we? Oh, enemy destroyer. And he is getting uncomfortably close. But I don't want to waste 14-inch armour-piercing shells on a destroyer. Especially since I'm actually having some success, very unexpectedly, at hitting these enemy battleships at extreme range. So what instead I'm doing is I'm focusing my secondary gun batteries on this destroyer in case he gets too close. And then all of my secondaries will light this guy up if he is dumb enough to get within secondary battery range. But at the same time, and, and by the way I'm doing this by holding down control and clicking on the destroyer. You can see the icon over him there to indicate that my secondaries are aiming at him if he gets within range. But at the same time, I don't want to sail straight into a spread of torpedoes, so I'm turning the ship around. Now, because of the way I'm turning, my rear batteries are still going to be able to engage targets like that St. Louis cruiser. And this was a... Well, this was a very, very confident St. Louis driver, because... <laughs> I could only fire at him with four of my 14-inch guns, but killing cruisers is what battleships are for. It was a spectacularly dumb move from that St. Louis. He, he should never have engaged a battleship at that kind of range if he can possibly help it. If you're in a cruiser and you absolutely definitely have to start trading shots with a battleship, you want to be doing it at the extreme range of your cruiser's guns. And the reason you want to be doing that is because your survival depends on the battleship missing you. 
missing shots hurts a battleship a hell of a lot more than it does a cruiser because a battleship takes so much longer to reload its guns for a second shot. And you stand a better chance of making that battleship miss shots at you the further away from him you are because that gives you time to start dodging his shots when you see him shooting at you. At those kind of ranges, there was no possibility that that St. Louis was going to be able to avoid the shots. By the time he sees the flash from my gun barrels, it's too late. He's already dead. Now, long-range shooting in your battleships. The Congo can fire, when fully upgraded, out to ranges of 21.2 kilometers. But, as I mentioned earlier, it's hopelessly inaccurate at those kind of ranges. Now, I have actually been quite lucky so far in this game. Extreme range shooting, I've managed to hit targets maybe 20% of the time which is way better than normal, but anybody can get lucky. What usually happens is, well, what you're going to see here. Hey, now, I zoomed in just a little bit too late, but trust me, those were well-aimed shots, and not one of them hit. You get a much better example of the sort of thing I'm talking about with my second salvo. So my guns are almost reloaded. It takes me 30 seconds to reload these 14-inch guns. Just my fire. Shots out. No islands in the way to... Uh, occlude the shots from my rearmost gun battery this time. Shots are in the air, and he's not manoeuvring to avoid them at this range, because he's not looking at me, and every single one of them missed. Now you could quite clearly see that some of the shots went long, and some of the shots went short. I straddled that target with my fire, which basically means that they were well-aimed shots. But the amount of dispersion that you suffer at that kind of range means that, well, you fire a full salvo at a ship at that kind of range, even if he's not manoeuvring to avoid your shots, and he gets plenty of time to manoeuvre to avoid your shots, because you can see how long it takes the shells to arrive at the target area. You're lucky if you hit with one out of the full eight shots that you fire with the Congo's main batteries. In order to get proper effective gunnery, you pretty much seem to have to close to 13 kilometres or less, and I don't think that's by accident because 13 kilometers or less is the maximum firing range of a lot of the cruisers in the game. I've pretty much had a, a free lunch up until this point because, well, that enemy Congo isn't shooting at me. He's engaging the friendly Congo up front, and we've got torpedo bombers going in from our Tier 4 carriers. They've dropped torpedoes. He's maneuvering to avoid them. This means, of course, that the friendly Congo is able to cross his T and fire all of his guns into that enemy Congo, and the enemy Congo can only fire at him with his forward mounted batteries. Of course they're so close that they're also lighting each other up with their secondaries, but I am now at the perfect range where my guns become well as dangerous as they're going to get. As long as I aim well, and this guy's going to start eating torpedoes, but from this kind of range, as long as I aim properly, I have no excuse for not hitting this guy. And those look like they're on target. Close enough for government work. So, we still have all three of our Congos, we've got both of our carriers, and we've got three cruisers. They're down to two of their battleships, they still have two of their carriers, but we know exactly where one of them is. And they've got one destroyer. How could we possibly lose? <laughs> now that Congo up there, not watching where he's going, he's just run into that island. Now, I fire a salvo, aware that he's going to be reversing, and it's not extreme range but it's not ideal range either, and I do score a hit. It's not a massive amount of damage, but damage is damage. Actually, I think I hit him with five shots, which is bloody impressive at that kind of range, but it looks like only one of them penetrated, and it didn't penetrate anywhere. That was going to lead to critical damage, so he's managed to get himself off the rocks, and he's probably going full ahead now, but it's going to take a while for him to get up to full speed, so while he's basically dead in the water, I fire my second salvo. And here's that long-range battleship accuracy for you again. And once again, well-aimed barrage. Shots went left, right, they went long, they went short. A couple of them hit him. Didn't do much more than scare him. The ones that hit didn't penetrate. But his upper deck crew's got a damn good drenching from all of those near misses. And there's a cruiser off to my port side also engaging him. And you can see this guy, he's having a bit of, hmm, shall I go for the cruiser, go for the battleship, go for the cruiser, go for the battleship. And now he starts turning around, which, well, even though he manoeuvred at the last second, again, well-aimed shot. Shots bracketed him, straddled his ship, but now he's clearly going for me. He's turned broadside on, and here come all of his guns. So I start manoeuvring, and most of his shots miss. Took very, very minor damage. 
My guns are about ready to fire. He's still taking shots from that cruiser over to the port side. I unleash a full broadside into him, and we're basically now in a gunnery duel between two battleships. Scored some good hits. I'm definitely doing more damage to him than he's doing to me. Plus the fact that he's constantly being harassed by that cruiser. He's going to get the next series of shots off, but hang on, he's turning in towards me. Well, that means he can only fire his forward gun batteries at me, so he's basically handing me the advantage. Although he did do substantial damage with that barrage. So that was a lot of damage, so I use my battleship consumable. Battleships get a special ability. They get a damage repair ability, as opposed to the damage control ability that everybody else gets. Everybody gets the ability to put out fires, prevent flooding, uh, fix damaged equipment on their ship. But battleships get the ability to actually repair their health bar. So you can see my health is actually creeping up, despite the good solid hit that he landed on me with his forward batteries. But again, he's just steaming straight towards me. And didn't do an awful lot of damage with that shot. So I'm putting eight shots into him for every four shots that he's putting into me. And he's taking fire from a cruiser. What the hell is he doing? The enemy team's down to three ships now. And he's probably the most dangerous ship left on their team. And he's just throwing his health away. We're now within secondary battery range. And all of my secondary batteries are able to open up on him. From here, he has to start turning, and then only his forward secondaries are actually... There they are now, getting the opportunity to fire at me, but I'm just hammering him in straight broadsides with all of my 14-inch guns and all of my secondary batteries. And he's being fired upon from the rear by that cruiser. I've set him on fire again. He's just used his damage control ability to put the first fire out. Oh, hang on a minute. I think I know what he's doing now. <laughs> Look at this. This guy actually sailed across 16 kilometers of map just to be able to ram me. <laughs> I saw it coming far too late. Look at that. Well, I would call that a successful trade. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Can't really argue. Um, he should never have been in the situation where ramming me was the only way he was going to be able to sink me. Um, but I think he planned on ramming me right from the start. <laughs> yeah, top tip. Don't get rammed by enemy battleships if you can possibly help it. Uh, it will not go well. So, yeah, well done to him. It was amusing anyway. So, we've got one pretty much full health Congo class battleship, both of our carriers, and a cruiser against one destroyer and one detected enemy carrier on very low health who has almost all of his air squadrons shot up. So it will come as no surprise to anybody, oh and we're capping by the way, and it will come as no surprise to anybody to find out that this was actually a draw. <laughs> no really. See, this is what happens when you let people from World of Tanks into the closed beta of World of Warships. They can lose anything. 140,000 credits and over 1,000 experience on a defeat. In case you're interested, I did actually take 30,000 ramming damage from that enemy Congo, which was absolutely, in that situation where I was about to kill him, ramming me was 100% the right thing to do. Of course, he was only in the situation where I was about to kill him because he was so intent on ramming me from the second he clapped eyes on me. <laughs> but, yeah, who cares? It was pretty funny. Well, from a game where I'm top tier in the Congo and I still can't win, to a game where I'm very much not top tier in the Congo. This is a tier 7 match. There are Nagato-class battleships. I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce that. Is it Nagato or Nagato? The Englishman in me wants to call it the Nagato. It's probably wrong, but that's what I'm going to call it. But anyway, they've got them in this game. It's a Tier 7 battleship, and it has vastly superior firepower to the Congo, although the Congo does have the edge in speed and manoeuvrability. Strangely enough, they've actually got some Tier 4s in this game. The enemy team have got a pair of Mayogi-class battleships, the Japanese Tier 4 battleship. In fact, there's one of them right there, and he's inside firing range. Once again, of course, horrible accuracy at this kind of range. You shouldn't be expecting to destroy targets at extreme range with your battleships. You can soften them up. 
for when they get within range of you to give you a bit of an advantage over them. But, and, well, there you go. Perfectly aimed shot. Once again, shot straddled him. A couple of shots went short, a couple of shots went long. A lot of them actually hit him. That's the way it is. And it's a perfectly fine balancing mechanic as far as I'm concerned. You, you shouldn't expect to be able to kill targets 21 kilometers away. We've actually spotted their aircraft carrier here, by the way. I'm still firing high explosive. I'm trying to just soften targets up at long range. Do damage, force them to use their damage control consumable. Seeing how this works out. Particularly because the shots are so inaccurate at this kind of range. And you don't have to score a direct hit to do damage with high explosive. As in World of Tanks, looks like the Miyogi there is firing at me. I don't expect him to hit. Yeah, he fell short. So I'm firing a high explosive barrage at that carrier. Because, as in World of Tanks, high explosive in World of Warships has a splash radius. So this is a little experiment I'm conducting to see if I can be more effective at long-range fire with HE rather than AP. And there you go. I actually hit the carrier. And we set him on fire. So if nothing else, that's going to force him to use, and he has used it, his damage control consumable. So that's now going to be on cooldown. If he needs it again in a hurry, it's not going to be available. Second salvo out, again at the carrier. If I hit him and set him on fire again, great. But I'm not actually expecting to. Not at these kind of ranges. I'm, I'm quite literally just taking shots at targets of opportunity as I head towards my objective. Which, ooh, that looks like a Cleveland or Pensacola class cruiser. Let's see. Oh, yeah, it's a Cleveland. Cleveland's are dangerous ships. Very impressive anti-aircraft armament. Uh, they have four gun turrets with three guns in each. They're still only 157mm guns. You don't start getting 203mm guns in American cruisers until the Pensacola at Tier 7, but it's got a very, very rapid rate of fire. Speaking of cruisers, that genius over there has just launched a very ambitious torpedo spread at nothing in particular, completely uncaring of the fact that there's a friendly destroyer in the way. And then, watch this. Guess what he does next? There you go. Yeah, sails right into another friendly cruiser. <laughs> luckily, you can't do that much damage to friendly ships by ramming, and luckily the destroyer was paying attention to the genius behind him and managed to get out of the way of his torpedoes. But, well, you know, multiplayer gaming. The only thing wrong with multiplayer gaming is that there are other players in it. Oh, that's not good. Okay, the smoke screen wasn't quite as effective as I hoped it was going to be. And that is a Japanese Mogami-class cruiser. Now, I don't know an awful lot about the Mogami. I find that World of Warships, like World of Tanks, you get a lot better at it if you understand what your opponents can and can't do. And the only way to do that is to play those ships. Now, I haven't really gone very far down the Japanese cruiser line, so I don't know what his guns are like, but I know he's going to have torpedoes. I'm not really worried about his torpedoes at that kind of range, but you can see how rapidly his guns fire. So, all I can fire at him is my two forward mounted gun batteries. So, four shots out, three of them hit, five and a half thousand damage. Now, as he's turning, he's already reloaded, and he does uh, 3,700 damage to me, so it wasn't a bad shot. However, I'm not really interested in chasing after that guy, because we've got a whole bunch of ships heading up after him, which is why he's turned and is running the other way. But those two Cleveland-class cruisers that have done an end run around this island here, they're within firing range of our aircraft carriers. And I am in a fast ship, and those are just cruisers after all, and I'm in a battleship. We do have a Pensacola-class cruiser trying to defend the carriers, and obviously the carriers aren't just going to sit there. They're launching torpedo bombs as well. Somebody's still shooting at me, but didn't do anything. Don't really care. So I'm going to go full speed ahead and assist the Pensacola in defending our carriers. Yep, everything seems to be under control behind me. Let's get in there and save the carrier queens. So it's two Clevelands. Torpedo bombers going in. Clevelands have launched their uh, spotter planes, which aren't going to help them against the torpedo bombers. But the Clevelands do have very, very powerful anti-aircraft defences. You can see them lighten up those torpedo bombers. But, oh, hello! Surprise Congo! 
And yeah. Eight shots fired, four hits. I can do better than that. Still did over 5,000 damage. And now the tables are very definitely turned on these two guys. Up until now, they were given that Pensacola serious problems. Pensacola's got bigger guns, but two Clevelands fire. Well, they have a hell of a lot more damage per minute than a single Pensacola. But now that the Congo has arrived to give a bit of support, well, they're probably not feeling too clever anymore. The guy at the rear has switched his fire against me. I'm focusing my secondaries on the guy at the front. If I get within range, the secondaries will take care of him, and I can continue concentrating my main battery guns on the guy at the rear. But you can see how quickly these Clevelands fire. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna hang a I'm gonna hang a turn at the starboard here. So I can continue firing at the guy at the rear. But the guy at the front, I'm gonna put this island between me and him. And oh, it looks like another cruiser just joined the party. Hooked around the headland from the north and he's coming round. He's in firing range of the Cleveland at the rear. The Cleveland at the front is on perilously low health. But you can see how quickly these guys fire. It's very important if you're in a battleship that you do not miss when you're shooting at cruisers that are within firing range of you. Because it takes you 30 seconds to reload your guns. And a cruiser like the Cleveland can put a lot of shots into you in the space it takes you to reload your guns. This guy's done though. He's not getting out of here. Shots out. Oh, he's dead before my shots land. But you can see the damage that I've suffered. I haven't actually taken that much physical damage from the two uh, Clevelands. Chances are they're probably firing high explosive at me for some reason because they're doing a lot of module damage. They've knocked out gun turrets. Things like that. Which is an unusual choice because you can do substantial damage to a Congo if you're firing armor piercing. But regardless of what ammunition they were actually firing, high explosive, AP, whatever the hell it was, they didn't actually do that much damage to me. Um, beyond knocking out one of my gun turrets, which I've now repaired, I've used my battleship only damage repair ability to patch up most of the damage that was inflicted on me by the Megami and the two Clevelands, and uh, while all that was going on, we've managed to lose two battleships, a cruiser and a destroyer. So we've nailed those two Clevelands, and somebody's just sank another cruiser. And we're capping? Well, it's possible that whoever that is in the cap circle isn't actually trying to cap, he's just manoeuvring to avoid fire from enemy ships and he happens to be in the cap circle. Um, but anything's possible, somebody might actually be dumb enough to think that they're going to win by capping when there's still two-thirds of the enemy team left. Although having said that, I have seen it happen. Sometimes people are just not paying attention to the cap counter. Oh, there we go. They've hit him. Okay, so it's still game on. I was kind of worried at this point that that was going to be it. It was going to be game over, we're going to win by capping, and it would be a disastrous first win of the day for me in the Congo. But uh, somebody has headed back. In fact, it looks like most of them are heading back in order to try to defend the cap. What's happening right now, at least judging from the known positions of the enemy ships that have been spotted, is that it looks like the majority of the enemy team were coming around the western side of the map, saw what was happening to their flag, and then most of them turned back to deal with it, leaving one lone battleship to push on, who's now over there, and now the carriers have to defend themselves from him. This guy's also in a position to threaten our flag. So right now it's decision time for me. Am I going to assist the carriers again, or am I going to join the main attack, which is not doing very well at all? around to the north. Of course, it wouldn't be a multiplayer game if some idiot who got himself killed early on didn't start criticising the decisions made by the rest of his team as being directly responsible for his death. Some tactical genius who clearly thinks he was Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson in an earlier reincarnation reincarnation? Incarnation. Starts criticising my decision to divert from the attack to the north in order to defend both our carriers and our flag against those two Clevelands. Apparently it's all my fault that those ships, all of which were higher tier than me, failed so miserably in the attack to the north against what at the time was inferior opposition. However, that's not just one battleship anymore that's now making a run on our carriers and our flag from the other side. It's two battleships and a cruiser. So screw you, Horatio Nelson. I made the right decision. And it's about to start paying dividends. 
Now, those are two Miyogi-class battleships, and they're only Tier 4, but between them, they've got 12 14-inch guns. And there is a Cleveland-class cruiser with them as well. Now, the range isn't perfect. They're sort of just at the limit of effective firing range. But they are still within firing range, and my guns are loaded, so I unload on them. The first guy's about, there you go, about 12, 13 kilometers away. He's starting to get to within effective firing range now, and he's turning broadside on. So I'm not sure if that means he's aiming at me. You can see the Pensacola to the rear, putting shots in. They seem to have gone a bit long. Forward guns shot out. Rear guns shot out. Shots from the forward turrets hit. Do some damage. Shots from the rear turrets hit. <laughs> and they do some damage too. So, scratch one battleship. We've lost sight of the Cleveland for the moment, but he's probably not feeling quite as confident as he was a couple of minutes ago. There's the remaining Miyogi. He's firing. Oh, there's the Cleveland. Pensacola, of course, will be firing at the Miyogi because the Cleveland was unspotted. Miyogi's shots land short. Pensacola's don't. That's knocked out the other Miyogi. So... We've gone from two enemy battleships and one cruiser very, very quickly to one cruiser. So, Cleveland. Now, he's fast, but he's not fast enough. Well, he's faster than a Congo, but he's not that much faster than a Congo. So he's going to have to engage me. And very, very rapid-firing guns. Not particularly high caliber. The Cleveland is the last American cruiser that gets 157mm guns. From the Pensacola on, it's 203mm guns. But the Cleveland does fire very, very quickly. And it's got 12 of those guns. So, I'm taking advantage of this island to shield me from his gunfire and give me more time to get my guns reloaded and put some return fire into him. I'm not alone, of course. I've got the Pensacola backing me up. Pensacola, of course, doesn't fire as quickly as the Cleveland, but he's got bigger guns. The Cleveland is pretty much on full health, but then again, so am I. Now, at these sort of ranges, I can do some serious, serious damage to this guy, providing I hit. And there we go. That is serious, serious damage. That's half of his health. It's entirely possible for a Cleveland to beat a Congo in a gunnery duel. But this guy is making every rookie mistake in the book. For a start, he's too close. At this kind of range, he needs to make me miss, and you can only do that if you give yourself enough distance to be able to dodge my shots. Right now, he's actually sailed so close, I'm not just shooting him with my main battery guns. All of my secondary batteries are opening up on him as well, and he's tunnel visioning on me. So he's completely unaware that he's about to eat the spread of torpedoes because we have a carrier down here as well. And... yep, there he goes. Not paying attention to what's going on around him, tunnel visioning on one target and getting far, far too close to a battleship when you're in a cruiser that doesn't have torpedoes. So, notwithstanding the brilliant tactical advice given by the ghost of Admiral Nelson earlier on, we have managed to account for five of the eight enemy ships that our team has sunk. We have defended the cap and our aircraft carriers, not once, but twice. We've kept our carriers in the game. And these two carrier drivers appeared to know what they were doing. They have done a substantial amount of damage during the course of this game. And we're finally able to start steaming north and start adding my firepower to that of the battleship that we have up here who's been severely pressured by a full health Tier 7 Nagato-class battleship as well as a pretty badly beaten up Megami-class cruiser. That's actually the Megami that I hit with one of the first salvos that I fired earlier on in the game. If only one of these shots had hit. Look at that. That guy's on such low health that one of those 14-inch shell hits, plunging fire from directly above, straight through the decks, it would have finished him off. But he gets away. Now, I have Tier 7 Nagato-class battleship problems. Oh, oh, and torpedoes coming in from the port side as well. But I saw them coming. I've manoeuvred to avoid them. I'll be fine. Actually, no, I don't have Nagato problems. The Nagato now has Congo problems. Now, he's engaging the battleship to his front, which means he can only fire at him with his two foreign gun batteries. I, of course, am broadside onto him. I mean, he's broadside onto me, but he's not pointing his guns at me. So, well, it's one of Murphy's laws of combat. Never discount the value of teamwork. It gives the enemy something else to shoot at, and the enemy is shooting at something else. So, hooray. This is basically just giving me free shots at this Nagato while he's concentrating on 
the battleship to his front. It looks like somebody's just sunk the enemy destroyer. But we've just lost another ship of our own. Looks like the Nagato has finally taken out... Yeah, there we go. We've just lost another two ships. These guys did not go down easily. The battleship that the Nagato was shooting at is now dead, which means that the Nagato is now free to give all of his attention to me. Of course, he's got to turn his turrets around, and mine are already pointed in the right direction. Shots out. Wait for it. Booyah! <laughs> That's half of his health. <laughs> of course, he's now free to start shooting at me, but ooh, are those his anti-aircraft guns? Those are his anti-aircraft guns. He looks like he's about to have torpedo problems. He does in fact have torpedo problems. He's firing at me, but he's maneuvering wildly to avoid these torpedoes, so... It's funny how Admiral Nelson doesn't have anything to say for himself now, does he? The guy who was criticising my decision to keep the carriers in the game. <laughs> well, I think that decision paid off. That guy ate all but one of the torpedoes that were launched at him because he was concentrating on me. Which put him on such low health that my next salvo was able to sink him. So that's a tier 7 battleship taken care of very, very quickly indeed. Which means there is just one ship left on the enemy team. And it's that bloody Megami class cruiser. And he's firing his anti-aircraft guns. But I don't actually think that those dive bombers have any ammunition. I think the carrier captain is just using them to loiter over the area and keep that guy pinpointed. Because that guy has less than 2,000 health. A dive bomber attack would have finished him off. Unfortunately, I'm sitting there expecting this guy to die at any second because I can see dive bombers in the air over him. And so that encourages me to keep chasing the kill. What I should have done if I'd known that those dive bombers were out of ammunition was to turn this ship around and hightail it to the other end of the cap circle because here comes the shot that seals the fate of the game. There it is, he's just reset the cap. He's hit me. Because this guy actually knows what he's doing. Unlike the Cleveland captain, who I killed earlier, who closed to such ridiculously short range that even my secondary guns couldn't fail to hit him, this guy is keeping the distance at the extreme range of his guns, which gives him plenty of time to manoeuvre to avoid return fire from me, and this is my best possible chance of scoring a hit on him. He's restricted in his ability to manoeuvre as he avoids those torpedoes. Unfortunately, this one was all me. I can't blame the Congo's inaccurate guns for that. The shot in the middle would have hit him and would have sunk him if I just led the shot a little bit more. But, same old story. Would have, could have, should have, didn't. And so, this match, like the one before it, ends up in a draw. I swear, I love the Congo, but I couldn't get a win in this thing if somebody died and left it to me in their will. <laughs> Look at that. 155,000 credits. Nearly 1,400 experience on a defeat. But you don't get a result like that in a bad ship. Uh, look at that. Top on experience earned in a tier 7 game. Tier 5 battleship. It's a good ship. I love it dearly. I think it's one of the best ships for its tier in the game. You just don't do 87,000 damage in a bad tier 5 ship in a tier 7 match. The, the Congo is a fantastic ship. I've played the Japanese battleships up to tier 7 and the Nagato. And the Congo is more fun than the Nagato. It's more fun than the Fuso. And the reason it's more fun is because while the Nagato and the Fuso at tier 7 and 6 have got the armour and they've got the firepower, they don't have the speed of the Congo. The Congo has got that perfect mix of that little bit of everything that it needs. It's got the armour, it's got the firepower, and it's got the speed. It's easily the most fun of the Japanese battleships that I have played so far. I think it's a fantastic ship, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it too. Just before we finish off, as a reward for those of you who've sat through all 40, nearly 45 minutes of this video, I've got some more World of Warships beta keys to give away. For a chance of winning one of the beta keys, all you have to do is click the link, if you haven't already, in the video description. Good luck to you all, and uh, here's hoping I'll see you soon in the World of Warships beta test. As always folks, take care, and I'll catch you next time.